Okay, so again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this um, asynchronous class of ours for Clinical Chemistry 1. So again, uh, I'm greeting everybody a good day. So we'll be continuing our discussion about analytical techniques, instrumentation, and also eventually um, on the latter part of our discussions, we'll be talking about your automation. So again, um, I hope everybody is doing well. So if you want to follow along, um, we're still on chapter five of your bishop. So if you want to follow um, while I am discussing, you may use your bishop chapter five. So for this morning, we'll, we'll actually be gonna talking about your electrophoresis. So I hope you already have um, finished watching spectrophotometry, um, AAS fluorometry, and even your chemiluminescence. Okay, your luminescence for today. We're going to discuss electrophoresis in this particular video. So let's get started and proceed with our discussion. So as you all know, um, electrophoresis is a base is um, one of the most common uh, instrumentation right now, not only in clinical chemistry, but as we move towards molecular biology, you'll actually be more familiar and you'll be introduced to electrophoresis even more. So what do we mean by electrophoresis? So it's actually a, um, a play of words, okay, a combination of your electro, which means your um, which means your electrical charge or your electricity. Phoresis means um, separation through uh, through the use of your through the use of your pores. Where we will be talking about that later on when we talk about your um, your stationary medium for this particular instrumentation. So to get started, what is electrophoresis? So electrophoresis is the se separation of charged compound based on their electrical charge. So take, for example, you have a particular solution with different uh, molecules in it. And remember that these molecules, they do have their own charges. So whether they are positively charged or negatively charged ions, okay, whether they are cations or anions, they will be migrating um, through your... Um, through our medium and they will be separated according to their charges okay they will be separated according to their charges so the process um, electrophoresis in some of your references is also defined as the process of separating your charged constituents so take for um just like what i was mentioning on your solution we have different charged um analytes or con constituents where we will be separating them through the use of electrical current okay we'll be separating them through the use of electrical current. So when we're talking about electrophoresis, we're actually uh, the two most common um, methods of electrophoresis is, is your iontophoresis and your zone electrophoresis, okay? Your iontophoresis and your zone electrophoresis. So uh, moving forward, let's talk about uh, more about your electrophoresis. So an important thing that you need to know first, um, just like what I, I was mentioning, your um, analytes, they are um, ions with charge, okay? So if a particular molecule or a particular uh, substance has, uh, has the ability to be both positively or negatively charged depending on the isoelectric point or the pH of a particular solution, we refer to them as AMFO. Theric, okay so ampotheric these are substances that can have I either okay that can have either um, a negative charge a zero charge or, or a positive charge depending on the condition and we're, when we're talking about your condition you can under and uh, encircle condition and write this um beside it when we're talking about conditions we're talking about your isoelectric point and also your ph Okay, we're talking about your isoelectric point and your pH. So those conditions would determine or would dictate if a ampoteric molecule or an ampoteric ion would be a positively, negatively charged or a neutral molecule. Okay, so a perfect example of your ampoteric, okay, an ampoteric molecule are your proteins. So depending on the isoelectric point and pH of a particular solution, they can be positively or negatively charged, um, depending again on your condition. So ampoteric, um, just let me just be clear with when it comes to ampoteric, um, your ampoteric can be positive or negative. 
Okay? So, one at a time lang. Okay? So, a particular molecule can be positive, a particular molecule can be negative according to or depending to a particular condition. That is ampoteric. Why do I have to clear that? Because we also have your zwitter ion or zwitterion. So, when we talk about zwitterion or zwitter ion, this is a particular molecule that has both your positive and negative charge at the same time. Okay, so that's the their difference when it comes to ampoteric and zwitterion or zwitter ion, depending on what um um dep depending on how you would want to pronounce it. Okay, so remember that ha ampoteric and your zwitter ion or your zwitterion. Um, on the other hand, we also have your anions. So when we talk about anions, these are negatively charged. Um, these are negatively charged molecule, okay? These are negatively charged molecule that migrates to the anode. Later on, we'll discuss what are anode and cathode for you to be able to understand them. So the reason why we call them anion, because these molecules migrate to the anode, okay? They migrate to the anode. So when we talk about um, an ion, these are ions with negative charge. Okay. On the other hand, we also have your cation. Cations, these are positively charged ions on the other hand, which migrate to the cathode. Again, when we say cation, they have a positive charge. These are positively charged ions that would migrate to the cathode. So let me just be clear between cathode and anode because most of the time, um, some of the students have mistaken that anode is negatively charged and cathode is positively charged. Actually, it's not. Okay? Your anode, these are actually your positively charged electrode. Okay? These are your positively charged electrodes. So just like um in magnetism, right? In magnetism, op opposite charges or opposite poles attracts. Okay? Opposite poles attract. Similarly, when it comes to your charges, opposite charges would also attract. That is the reason why your negatively charged ion would migrate or would be, um, yeah, they would migrate to your positively charged electrode, which is now your anode, okay? So I hope we're clear with that. So if it is an anion, we're talking about the ion, so it is negatively charged. But if we're talking about anode, and cathode, anode is positively charged electrode, and your cathode is the negatively charged electrode. That is also the same reason why your cations, your positively charged ions, will be attracted or will migrate towards your cathode. So this is our very important um, foundational um, foundational. Um, concepts when it comes to electrophoresis so that when we move along to your discussion with electrophoresis, you'd be able to understand anion, cations, anodes, and electrodes better. Okay? Now, with that being said, okay, with that being said, um, I also just want to uh, remind everybody that when it comes to electrophoresis, there are different conditions or different um, factors that could actually affect the mobility of your particle. So please do remember that when it comes to electrophoresis, um, perhaps um, just a an advanced um, discussion to you guys, remember that electrophoresis and chromatography are somehow um similar again i'm telling i'm saying they are similar okay similar in a sense that we are separating um substances or molecules from a particular solution so one is passive the other one is um the other one which is your electrophoresis would apply now your um electricity okay so even though um we have your electricity other factors can still play into role when i say um they can still play into role meaning to say they can still affect okay they can still affect your um electrophoresis so one of those things that could actually affect the mobility of your particle are number one the net charge of your particle okay when we talk about the net charge of your particle whether they are positively or negatively charged if they are an anion or cation um, that would affect their um that would affect their um that would affect their mobility so always remember that most of the time okay most of the time um the the, the the electrode nearest to your sample well okay the electrode nearest to your sample well are your cathode and then the farthest ones are your um anode okay the part the fastest the farthest one are your anode so always remember that your net negative your net charge okay your net charge would actually affect okay your net charge would affect um the mobility of your particle aside from that obviously 
Okay, we're also gonna talk about your size and the shape of the particles. Re remember that these molecules will pass through a porous membrane, which we call your support medium, okay, or your support media. Later on, we'll discuss about that, the different components of your electrophoresis. So the, their size and their shape would also affect their mobility, okay? So just like, um, take for example, yeah, you are trying to, um, you have your filter, okay, you have your filter and you're trying to, um, decant a particular solution. So the rate of decantation would also affect depending on the, the size of the, the particle, okay, the, the size of the particle that you would want to be removed, and also um the size of your um the size or your medium in itself, which is bullet number four, chemical property or physical pro properties of your medium, okay? So the chemical and physical properties of your medium could also affect the mobility of your particle. The strength of electric um, electric or electrical field could also affect your substances from migrating. So if you, um, if you um, apply too low, okay, too a little electrical charge or electricity on the system, then it will be slower. If you um, up it up a notch, it, if you accidentally have it um, to the maximum, it will also be fast, okay? It would also be, um, the migration of your particles would also be too fast, okay? So you would want to have um, an electrical charge or an, uh, the strength of your electrical field a little on the middle that would allow your uh, molecules or your particle to um, migrate into your medium properly. And of course, we also have your electrophoretic um, temperature. Always remember that when temperature is lower than the optimal temperature, your particle might move slower. So just like um, if it's colder temperature, if it's a colder temperature, particles, uh, the mobility of your particles will be slower. And if it is too high, okay, or the temperature is hotter, Okay, or warmer, the particle would migrate fast, the faster than the usual. So again, we would want to have, we would want to be on the, the middle, the optimal temperature, optimal electrical charge to have an optimal uh, procedure, an optimal electrophoretogram by the end of your procedure. Now, having said that. Okay, these are the following. Um, these are the following components of your electrophoresis. So we have your power supply. Obviously, we have your buffer. You also have your support medium, your sample. Okay, the sample in itself or the sample well, and also the detecting system. So we'll be talking about them one by one. Although it will be brief, I just want to um create a new video about electrophoresis because my previous video um or my previous lecture about electrophoresis um is a bit chap a bit um a bit long and also we're having issues when it comes to its audio okay so having said that let's proceed with the first um component of, the, of your electrophoresis which are your uh, power supply. So your power supply obviously supplies a constant current or voltage in the system. So I just want to highlight constant current because any fluctuation on your current might affect your electrophoretic pattern. So always remember, um, you can either use um, a UPS or an, um, an EVR. Yeah. Uh, so that the voltage of your uh, machine or the voltage of your electrophoresis would be regulated. Aside from that, um, your power supply, since it would be providing the electrical current um, for the system, it would also be the one that would drive your molecules through your support medium. Again, just like what I am mentioning, your electrophoresis is a, a type of a kinetic, diff um, it uses your L energy already so that it could drive the particles faster compared to a usual diffusion, okay? So if we're going to depend on diffusion, that would take um, longer um, turnaround time, longer, longer procedure compared to when we are using your electrical current already. So this is also important. Um, your power source is also important when we're talking about other inst other um, instrumentation and other techniques, not only in ClinChem, but also in other um, sections of the medical laboratory science, such as your immuno, uh, immunology and serology. 
and in some cases, even your blood banking and hematology. Okay? So, aside from that, your um, power supply is also known as your driving force, obviously, because it would be the one that would help. Okay? It would be the one that would help your... Um, that would help your ions or your particles move through your support medium. So again, remember this, that the voltage depends on the ionic strength of your buffer, which is another component of your um, electrophoresis. So why do we need to uh, why do we need to maintain okay, a, a specific voltage and why is it dependent on the ionic strength of the buffer? Remember that when it comes to your electrophoresis, not only do we maintain a, um, a constant voltage or a constant electrical current, but we also want to maintain a constant, um, a constant um, pH. Okay, a constant pH within our system. So having a um having um com having to compute that um and knowing your ionic the ionic strength of your buffer would also um let you know how much or um what voltage will you be using for your um electrophoresis. Okay, so that is your power supply. So um next to your power supply, of course, we have your buffer. So similarly to the buffer that is in our body, your buffer in electrophoresis also carry the same function. So the um your buffer, okay, remember that your buffer um is used to provide ions that would carry the current and that would maintain the pH at a relatively constant value. So remember that buffers are um substances or compounds that would maintain uh, or that would prevent changes in your pH. Okay, so please do remember that buffer, okay, your buffer, okay, um, also um, your buffer are also ions that will enable the movement of your current and the migration of your particles. They are like conductors with, within your, um, they, would, they are like conductors within your electrophoresis system. Remember that uh, for the electricity to flow or for the electricity to uh, migrate, okay, for the current to, um, pass through the medium, it would need your buffer. Ayan, it would it would need your buffer. So remember your buffer being um your being the one that would uh, maintain your pH. And at the same time, it will also enable the movement. Okay, the movement of your current. Okay, remember had the movement of your current. So from the the power supply or the power source, um, it it can move along or it can move through your support medium through the help of your buffer okay through the help of your buffer so those are the first two components of your electrophoresis we're finished with your um, power supply next is your buffer now we're gonna go through um some of the um we're gonna go through some of the um important things about buffer before we move along to the next component so remember that your ph and your ionic the ionic strength of your buffer might affect your analyte that is why maintaining your buffer at a particular ph is very important okay so remember ionic strength was mentioned a while back in the computation or, or in knowing how much voltage or how much electrical energy, how much electricity, or how much voltage will you be applying for your system? And at the same time, it also gives you an idea about the pH. pH that is again important in um in your substances. Let me just um let me just reiterate the importance of buffer and pH in electrophoresis. No, so um a while back we were talking about ampoteric, correct? Uh, we're talking about ions that. Um, can either be positive or negatively charged depending on the pH of a particular solution. So if that um, if there are changes or drastic changes in your pH, the the mobility, okay, the mobility of your proteins could also change. So um, unlike the one that is already um, expected um, for their movement, okay, um, all of all your biomolecules has already. Um, we already know their electrophoretic mobility. So we usually compare it into a control. So the problem is he the problem now is that if the, the if you have problem with your pH or you have problem with your ionic strength, that could affect their electrical um uh, electrophoretic mobility. So instead of being the first one to migrate, they can become second or last 
because of problems when it comes to your pH and also your ionic strength. So that's why buffer um, is needed inside your electrophoretic system. So in general, your buffer is also a mixture of proton donating and also proton accepting substances. So remember, uh, a simple buffer. So some are electron uh, proton donate, donating and proton accepting so that they can maintain um, pH at a constant level. So the usual buffer that we're using are actually your barbital or your veronal with a pH eight, uh, with a pH of 8.6. Or in some cases, we can also use your tra your trisboric EDTA, uh, your trisboric EDTA with a pH of 8.6. Seven. Again, your trisboric EDTA with a pH of 8.7. So in general, your buffer, okay? So in general, your buffer is very important, number one, because it maintains your pH and the ionic strength of your system. It also allows the, the, the flow or the influx of current through your, um, through your medium. And most importantly, they maintain the pH so that... Um, it would not affect, okay, the buffer would not affect the electrophoretic mobility of your samples or your particles, okay? So aside from that, okay, um, so since we're talking about still, we're talking about buffer. So remember that um, here are the possible cases when it comes to um, any changes or abnormality when it comes to your pH. So pH, uh, if the pH is acidic, okay, um, your hydrogen ion would bind, okay, your hydrogen ion would bind to your molecule. So the ampullite, take for example, your protein, would become positively charged. And instead of migrating, um, since they are now positively charged, okay, since they are now positively charged, they will now migrate to your cathode, okay? So they will now migrate to your cathode. So instead of migrating towards the, the anode, okay, towards migrating the anode, they will migrate the opposite direction. So that's a, a big problem. Similarly, if the pH is also basic or alkaline, it would now lose your um, hydrogen ion. So the ampullite now will become negatively charged. So in a nutshell, what I'm just trying to say here is that any changes on your pH would literally change the electrophoretic mobility of your substance. So it's important to maintain your pH. Okay, so pH at 8.6 or 8.7, depending on what is available in your laboratory and what is the optimal um, buffer that can be used in preserving the integrity of your substances. Aside from that, we also have your ionic strength. So similarly to your pH, any changes on your pH might affect your uh, might affect your um, might affect your uh, particle or your analyte. In pH, it would affect the charge of your particle. It would either become a positive or a negatively charged ion. When it comes to ionic strength, on the other hand, ionic strength um, has to has something to do with your um, the speed or the yeah the speed of your um, electrophore of your electrophoresis or the speed of your molecule or your particle. So if there is a low ionic strength, more charge will be carried. So meaning to say more electricity will be carried. So the faster the mobility would be. So if it is a high uh, if there is high ionic strength, on the other hand, there will be less charge that will be carried. So that would cause a slower mobility. So ionic strength is somehow related later on to your electroendosmosis. Okay, your electroendosmosis. So remember that when it comes to your buffer, huh? it affects your pH and it also affects your ionic strength. So if my ionic strength is very low, it the 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 mobility, okay, the mobility of the particle will be faster. If the ionic strength is low, okay, or rather if the ionic strength is high, rather, the um, there will be less electrical charge that will pass through the medium. It would lead to a slower mobility of your particle. Okay. So again, the ionic strength, um, ionic strength is inversely proportional to the um, rate of mobility or the mobility of your um, the mobility of your particle. So when we're, when I'm talking about mobility, it's we're talking about the speed. Okay, the speed um, on which your particle or your molecule will be passing through your support medium. 
Okay, so again, that is buffer. Important in maintaining your pH and your ionic strength to maintain the integrity or the, to maintain the charge of your particle and to maintain the 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 rate of of mobil the rate of mobility within the medium and also let us also not forget forget that your buffer is also important in um in um allowing the charge or the electrical energy to pass through the medium okay so that is your buffer now after your buffer okay we also have now your support medium or your support media so your support medium these are um, network of interacting fibers or polymers that is solid but traps large amount of solvent in in its pores um, or channels inside so remember that um remember that your support media okay your support media um, these are actually the the one that would allow the separation of your components. Okay, they, they will allow the separation of your component. So take for example your um your strainer. Okay, your strainer it would look uh your strainer it it is like a mesh or a network of fibers, correct? Or a network of polymers, similarly to your support media. That is also the idea for it. Okay, so it would um it would um prevent okay it would prevent bigger molecules to pass through that's why remember when it comes to the factors that affect your electrophoretic mobility the size of the molecule or the particle is um, a factor when it comes to their mobility so the larger molecules would migrate slower the smaller okay the smaller particles or the smaller molecules would have easier time passing through the support media okay so that's the idea there Okay, so in that case, we're able now to separate the bigger and the larger molecules in the solution. So always remember that the support media should not um, interact with the analyte. So meaning to say, they when we say do not interact with your analyte, similarly to your pH, or rather similarly to your buffer, your support media should not affect, okay, should not affect the particle so that it, they will not change their charge, they will not change their mobility, and they will not um, impede the movement of molecules through the medium. Okay, so perfect examples of your support media are your cellulose acetate. We can also use your agarose gel and your polyacrylamide gel. So these are the three most common um, support media being used in the laboratory. And they're actually um, specific use for each one of them. So we're gonna go and discuss about them now. Okay, so when we're talking about your cellulose acetate, um, usually it is best used for isoelectric focusing. So your cellulose acetate, it's obviously an, assist, um, an acetylated cellulose, okay, to form cellulose acetate by treating it, okay, your cellulose will treat it with your acetic anhydride to create your um, cellulose acetate. So when you're trying to separate your proteins, okay, you can we can separate your protein, okay, we can separate your serum protein into five bands. So remember that when it, when we're trying to separate your protein, we can separate them by um according to their sizes and according to their mobility. Okay, so we have your albumin, your alpha one, your alpha two globins, okay, alpha one, alpha two, your beta, and your gamma. So that is five bands all in total. So if you're trying to separate your protein into five fraction, okay, if you're trying to separate them into five fraction, say for example, you just want to know um, um, where are the um, alpha, alpha one, alpha two, the beta, or the gamma. We'll be discussing this in the um, during the midterm, uh, during the semifinal period, semifinal period in ClinChem. So the different um types of protein when we're talking about different types of protein we're not talking about the different amino acids but really the different um, polypeptide or proteins that are inside our body so there um, if you want to separate your protein you can use your cellulose acetate because that would suffice the need to separate them into five bands so you have your albumin you have your alpha 1 alpha 2 globins uh, globulins you have your um, you have your beta and you have your gamma um globe uh gamma globins okay so those are the five okay those are the five fractions of your protein so cellulose acetate would be good uh would be a great support medium for your proteins okay so aside from your cellulose <clears throat> Aside from your cellulose acetate, we also have here your agarose gel. 
So your agarose gel um, use, uh, it use a purified fraction of agar. So the good thing about your agarose gel is it is neutral and thus it does not produce electroendosmosis. So what do we mean by electroendosmosis? Electroendosmosis is a phenomenon where there, um, the, the medium creates an ionic cloud. Okay, and remember your ionic cloud, okay, when we have your ionic cloud, it can either increase or decrease your ionic strength, okay? So if there is an increase or decrease in your ionic strength, okay, the mobility will be affected. Not only that, that ionic cloud can also affect your pH. So if your pH is affected, um, the not only is the mobility of the particle is um is up, will be affected their charges will also be affected so in general okay in general um your electroendosmosis is a interference in electrophoresis whereby the mobility of your particle is affected okay specifically their ph and their ionic strength okay the ph and the ionic strength within the system okay so if you would want to avoid electroendosmosis you would want to use your agarose gel okay you would want to use your agarose gel so unlike your um, cellulose acetate that it can only divide a particular solution or into five fraction your proteins rather it can only divide your proteins into five fraction your agarose gel is good in this in 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 this sense because it can separate your protein into 10 to 15 bands so if you would want to read in advance you can actually scan and you can actually take a look at how many proteins there are in the body. There are actually a lot. You have your alpha-1 antitrypsin, your ceruloplasmin, transferrin, hemopexin, your immunoglobulins, IgA, M, E, E, D. So there are actually a lot of proteins inside the body. So a while back, if you just simply use your cellulose acetate, you can just divide them into five. Okay? And if you divide it into five, hindi mo ma-identify kung sino yung nandun sa loob ng band. Again, you, um, if you have only five bands, you cannot specifically point out uh, what, what specific protein is in there. Unlike if you use your agarose gel, there is a 10, um, 10 to 15 bands. You can specifically um, find out the exact location and the exact density of a particular protein in a partic uh, from a particular solution. Okay, that's the, that's the goal when it comes to your... Um, in your support media. So um, I don't know if you're getting it, but um, hopefully with this uh, with this an analogy, you'd be able to uh, you'd be able to uh, somehow get a glimpse of what this support media do does. Okay. So remember that when it comes to take for example, you're you're preparing your clothes for laundry. Isn't it when you you when you prepare your clothes for laundry? Okay, when you prepare your clothes for laundry, the usual, we separate the white, we separate the light color from the colored one. So take, for example, the just three classification. So whether that is a pants, a trouser, a jacket, a t-shirt, or a polo, okay, you will just be separating them according to color. Okay, when you say according to color, okay, all whites, all, all light colors, or all, all light colored, and all dark colored shirts or garments or clothes will be grouped together okay that's the thing about cellulose acetate we just group them according to their size or we just group them according to a particular characteristic of your protein but when it comes to cell your agarose gel we're becoming more specific so when we say more specific uh, we're trying not to separate the white shirts the white inner shirts okay the white pants the white polo from the light polo, from the light shirt, the, from the dark shirt, from the dark pants. You're getting my point. So with the help of, um, depending on the support media, you can, um, you can further separate or you can further, yeah, you can further se separate your um, solution into um, a more specific component, okay? So instead of just separating, take for example, sodium chloride salt, you can now separate them. Um, you can separate the sodium and you can separate the chloride. So that's just an example. Okay. So I hope we're, we're um I hope you're understanding me when it comes to um your support media or your support medium being able to separate your protein into different number of bands and what are these bands are for. Okay. So lastly, we have your polyacrylamide. Okay, your polyacrylamide. 
um, use um, separate your protein based on charge and also your molecular charge or or and also your molecular size. Okay, so when we talk about um, polyacrylamide, it is very much um, useful in isoenzyme determination. So remember, um, I hope everybody still remember the different classes of your enzyme. So you have your oxidoreductase, you have your transferase, your hydrolases, your, li your lyases, isomerases, and also ligases. So we have six classif classes of enzyme. So this, those six classes of enzymes, take for example, let me just take your um, lactate dehydrogenase. Your lactic, lactate dehydrogenase, have, they do have five isoenzymes. So you have your LDH1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So if you want to separate them further, uh, if you want to separate them further, you might actually want to use your polyacrylamide gel because your polyacrylamide gel is best used for isoenzyme determination. And um, unlike your cellulose acetate, it can only divide into five bands. Your cellulose acetate, it can only divide um, the bands to 10 to 15. When it, ayan, it can only divide um, the bands, um, the protein in um, into 10 to 15 bands, your polyacrylamide gel can do better. It has better resolution. Um, it can separate your protein into 20 or more fractions. So here, you can really point out where does your IgA, okay? Like, unlike, um, take for example, on the other hand, okay? When it comes to your cellulose acetate, I'll give an example. You have your... Um, your albumin alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, and gamma. So in the gamma region, you would want to look into um, the different immunoglobulin. So you would use your cellulose acetate. So you can separate now your IgG, IgA, M, E, and D. But there are also different isoforms or iso... Um, yeah, there are also different forms of IgG, take for example. So you can um, use polyacrylamide to further... Um, classify your proteins, okay? Because it can separate your protein um, into 20 or more fractions, okay? So you can classify it better or you can, yeah, you can dissect it better and you can um, identify um, the specific compound or the specific protein that you would want to find out. So most important um, in isoenzyme determination. Okay, so again, your polyacrylamide gel um, based its separation through charge and also your molecular side. So in a nutshell, we have your support media. Okay? We have your support media. So your support media can be a cellulose acetate, an agarose gel, and a polyacrylamide gel. Okay, a polyacrylamide gel. So those are the three support media that I will be discussing for this time. So with that being said, okay, this is still your... Um, support media so your support media they we do have your in your support media we do have the wells uh, prepared already on your support media so as you can see this is an example of your support media with your wells and this is how we dispense your samples okay this is how we dispense your sample so we have your um this is an automatic pipette so an automatic pipette and we're transferring, okay, we're transferring the, uh, we're transferring the substance, okay, or the sample into the well, okay, we're transferring it to the well. Now, finally, okay, so once you dispense your sample on the well, um, you, can, you simply apply the power source and then it will automatic, it will now run the electrophoresis and will separate your solution into its component, into different particles and molecules but the bigger question now sir after separating them how would i know or how would i identify a particular substance isn't it that's what we're after at the end of the day how would i be able to identify if what i actually um, isolated or what i actually separated here are pro this this specific protein that i'm looking for and did you know that your electrophoresis can also be used to quantify okay to quantify the substances that you're actually looking for. So if you would want to do that, okay, if you would want to do that, you can actually um you can actually um use a densitometer. Okay, if you use a densitometer, you would be able to identify the concentration of a particular substance that you um subjected into your electrophoresis. So in that case, ayan, so our detecting system now, 
okay, would come into play. But before that, remember that the result of your electrophoresis, consisting now the separated stand of your macromolecules, is generally called your electrophoretogram. So an example of here on your screen right now, these are examples of electrophoretogram. So um, take for example, we have samples 1 to 8. Okay, samples 1 to 8, these are actually the substances or the samples. So what about the M? Okay, the M there stands for your controls. Okay, so as you can see, um, with the help of your control, you would be able now to identify, okay, your controls are known uh, patterns already, electrophoretic pattern. So uh, we already know what substance would um, migrate in this particular region all throughout um, until the anode, the anode of your, um, all throughout the anode of your electrophoresis system. Okay, so as you can see here, the picture on your, the one on your left, if you're facing your screen, okay, the one on your left, we have M, okay, the M are your control, and from wells number one to eight, those are your, con those are your samples. So as you can see, you'd be able not to identify, oh, okay, this is a particular, for example, this is your um, alpha 2 um, proteins because they all migrated in this particular band. So that would um, actually help you there. So we also have here on the other hand. So here you can now identify, okay, you can identify the different strands or the different substances that are inside your solution. Okay, that's the beauty about electrophoresis. Okay, um, that's the beauty about electrophoresis. It would allow you now to identify uh, a particular substance or a particular particle better. Okay, but just like what I was mentioning a while back, um, with the use of your electrophoretogram, you can actually um, you can actually uh, measure them. Okay, so when it comes to detecting system first, okay, so when you use kasi, when you use your electrophoresis, it will just be a piece of um, support medium. So how will you be able to detect what um, compound are in there? So you can either use your direct observation. So if uh, direct observation, so you can just simply look at the agar or you can simply look at the support medium and you can already identify okay, the different um, particles or biomolecules that you already have separated. You can also use staining. So you can use a specific, um, um, you can use a chemical with a specificity um, for one chemical group. So take for example, these are uh, nucleic acids. So you can use a, uh, stain that would at um that would bind to the phosphate group of your your nucleic acids so you'd be able to identify and you would be able to stain them okay so um you can use your stain aside from that you can also use your radioactive dye so in here you can use your iodine 125 okay your iodine 125 as a radioactive dye so um, disclaimer when it comes to radioactive dye, um, a big um, a big consideration lang because of course um, this radio this radioactive dye are um, being uh, monitored by our PNRI. So always remember um, to also be cautious in using radioactive um, radioactive uh, substances and components in the laboratory. So aside from direct um, observation, staining, radioact uh, using a radioactive dye, you can actually use your UV visualization. So this is the simplest way to detect, okay? Um, simplest way to detect your um, band. So you just simply have a UV light, okay? You have your UV light um, and then you put the support medium on top. You'll be able now to um, generally, you'll, you'll be able now to um, identify your substances like this one on the photo on your left. Okay, so this is an, a UV visualization technique. Okay, so finally, ayan, so you can also, so those are observed, um, direct observation methods. Okay, you can stain them, you can use your radioactive dye, you can use your UV visualization. And if you would want to further identify the concentration of a particular substance in this, um, in your electrophoresis, you can use your densitometer. So your densitometer is a device that, me that measures the degree of darkness. So the darkness represents the optical density of, if you still remember what optical density is, that is the absorbance, okay? The absorbance. So um, in this case, the, the amount of optical density is directly proportional to the concentration of the substance or the component or the particle that we're measuring. So 
the degree of darkness of a photographic or semi-transparent material or of a reflecting um, surface. So again, in densitometer, we measure the degree of darkness or the degree of optical the, the optical density. In other words, the absorbance of that molecule. So the higher the absorbance or the higher the optical density, I'll just use optical density not to um, so that you won't be confused um, here. So the 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 amount, okay. The amount or, or the degree of your optical density is directly proportional to the concentration of the particle or the biomolecule that we're trying to detect using your electrophoresis. So in a nutshell, that's your electrophoresis. Very quick and very short discussion. So hopefully uh, you understand you understood my discussion for today. So Again, please do remember the different components of your electrophoresis, the purpose of electrophoresis, the factors affecting the mobility, the important, the important consideration when it comes to your buffer, your pH, your ionic strength, your, uh, remember what is electroendosmosis, the, uh, remember the different support medium, the, diff the number of fractions that they can um, separate your solution into, and of course, the different um, detecting system, um, and also your densitometer. So with that, thank you so much for listening, everybody. So please do remember, ayan, so this is the, I'm on the sky right now. So always remember that your attitude, uh, more than your aptitude, it will be the one that will determine your altitude. So again, thank you so much for listening. So if you have any questions or clarification, please um, feel free to send me a message so that I'll be able to guide you and help you understand the topic that we had today. So with that, thank you so much. So this has been um, Jomar Adams Gandhi. So if you have any questions, just feel free to send me a message through our TLC, through my email, or you can simply just message me on Messenger. So with that, thank you so much and have a great day.